that offended. But here's where I blew it. I didn't hear the instructions or receive the instructions that I was supposed to open up in prayer today. Oh my gosh, right? And David was talking. I thought to myself, did someone pray? I thought maybe he had prayed before I walked in. So that's on me. But can we pray before we go on to uh, the next speaker? Amen. Thank you so much. Father, you are awesome. Only you can bring us together today to dive into a subject, Father, that most don't want to talk about or want to ignore. Father, I pray that you would continue to move, Father, the Holy Spirit through our hearts as we think through and pray through, Father, our role in ministering to those who are broken. Forgive us, fathers in church, for not fulfilling our role as we should have been. But, Father, I just pray that you guide us. Show us, Lord. Connect the dots, Father. We're not good, Father. You are awesome, though. Father, I just pray that you would stir uh, organizations and churches of different denominations, different ethnic backgrounds, Maybe yeah. even different beliefs, but the common denominator, Father, is your son, Jesus, Father. I yes. pray that you yes. use the love that Jesus has for us, and that we have been called to, to, to minister and love others, Father, that you move through your people today. Show us things. Speak to us. Speak to me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. So I want to introduce our next speaker. Uh, before Lindsay comes up, we have a, I think it's a seven-minute video that Mississippians Against Human Trafficking made that is um, a really good overview um, to give us an idea of the kinds of things that are happening in our state. Lindsay is uh, an attorney who worked in private practice for several years. She also worked on the Mississippi uh, Supreme Court. And uh, so in 2018, she founded Mississippians Against Human Trafficking, uh, which is an umbrella organization uh, for groups and individuals and agencies who are in this fight uh, to end uh, sex trafficking in our state. And so um, we're going to start out by showing the video and then please welcome Lindsay as soon as that is done. Thank you. Trafficking. They think of other countries or poverty relief in our state arrested dozens of sex trafficking states. The undercover operation takes down cases of prostitution in our area. Human trafficking is happening here in Mississippi. It's like an underworld epidemic. It's, it's something that is creeping into all of our communities. much for having me today. I'm Lindsay Simmons with Mississippians Against Human Trafficking and um, I'll just kind of start a little bit telling y'all how I got here and then we're going to talk about what human trafficking is and is not and give y'all some time for questions. The Lord put human trafficking on my heart seven or eight years ago and I distinctly remember where I was in my vehicle on the way to work. Something on K-Love came on about trafficking. I don't even remember what they were really promoting and I just thought, huh, I, I don't I don't know about this, you know. So I get to work and I kind of Google a little bit the organization they had mentioned on K-Love and find out some information and it's just really pressed into my heart. Well, the next day I got an email from a girl I had known sort of at church growing up. I have no idea how I got on her email list. I never subscribed to that email. She was 
five or six years older than me. I weren't, we weren't really friends, but she was working with sex trafficking in Los Angeles. And then a few days after that, there was some other thing that came into my path, and I just thought, okay, Lord, I hear you. <laughs> this is three times in, you know, 72 hours. I've never heard of this before. And I did, the more I learned, the more I just got burdened about it. And for a long time, there wasn't anything to do. And I was kind of mad at the Lord. I'm thinking, you have put this horrific thing in my path, on my mind, and you've given me nothing to do, and I'm a doer. So what can I do? How can I fix this? Who can I talk to? How can I pray? What do I do? You know. So for a long time, there was just nothing, because there wasn't a lot going on in Mississippi. Then I found a company that made jewelry by women, that let women make jewelry who were um, rescued from trafficking. And so I sold jewelry for that company for a while, thinking this is a little bit of something I can do to help, you know. Um, and after, I, I'm, I say I'm a recovering lawyer, and after I was a lawyer for a while, um, my husband was a lobbyist, and he hired me. So I get into lobbying, and before I even start, somebody contacted me, and she said, you know, there's this bill they're going to try to pass next year. Will you help them? And my husband's like, this is fantastic. You haven't done one day's worth of paying work, and you're going to do some free work. Okay, well, that's great, Lindsay. So I'm like, sure, we can do this. So I got involved with some groups who were doing some legislation, and then... I um, helped write a report that kind of assessed the need in the Jackson area for, um, or what was really going on with sex trafficking of children. So I say all that to tell you, you don't have to be somebody who goes out and rescues victims in the street. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be able to build houses. But what is it that you do in your day-to-day -day life that can help this call? So I just want you to be thinking about that. Um, I lobby. I write grants. I do um, just teaching and training, things like that. That's what I can do. I don't work with victims day to day, but there's a need for everybody. So just be thinking, what is it that you do in your day to day life that can be used in this way somehow? So I'll just kind of start a little bit by telling y'all kind of what human trafficking is and what it is not. Have y'all seen the movie <coughs> Taken that came out a few years ago? Lots of heads, some no's. Give you a really brief synopsis. Um, college age, privileged, white girl goes on study abroad because that's what you do and you're supposed to do that and um, it's a great learning experience so she heads off with a friend overseas when they get off the train or plane or whatever some Middle Eastern nondescript ethnic person snatches them up and kidnaps them chains them up puts them in cages and puts them on an auction block at some point the girl's friend dies and that kind of there's not a lot of mention of that well, thankfully for this girl, her dad is Liam Neeson, and he is some CIA agent, and he starts tearing across the world, like killing everyone in his path to rescue her. And he gets to her, and he rescues her, and he leaves all the other girls in the cages, and they go home, and she gets a pony, and she's fine. And that's not human trafficking. It does not look like that. I've never heard a story like that. Every now and then, may, maybe that happens in some other countries. I don't know. That's not what we see here. What we see is a young girl who's run away from an abusive situation. She's on the street. A guy rolls his window down and says, you want me to take you to, for, a, for something to eat? You want some weed? You want a ride? And she says yes. And he drives her around the corner and sells her for $120 to a pimp. And that happens in Jackson every day. Um, it's also not smuggling. You think of truckloads or carloads full of people packed in the back of a you know, 18 wheeler, whatever it is, coming across the border. Well, that is smuggling. But smuggling is a crime against the country and its borders, and human trafficking is a crime against people. And sometimes it overlaps, but it's not always, it's not the same thing. For trafficking to occur, you don't have to move at all. So the word is a little bit confusing. You think of drug trafficking and gun trafficking, moving guns and drugs across borders. You can be trafficked in your own home and not move at all. Or you can be trafficked in your home and go to school and come back home and, and seemingly choose to stay in that environment. Um, it's also not just women and girls. That's the typical picture that we see. It is mostly women and girls. Um, international groups estimate that 50% of traffic victims are boys, which is a really high estimate but could be true. Our local guys in Jackson see two to one two females to one male that are being trafficked. So even if it's that percentage and not 50%, that's, you know, 30 something percent, that's pretty high. So um, the problem with boys is they don't see themselves as victims. They all, they, they're not, we don't teach them that like we do little girls. We don't teach them that they can be victims, so they don't see themselves as that. Um, so sex trafficking, the defi legal definition of it for, for what it's worth is um, sexual services, 
performed in exchange for something of value. And if you're under 18, that's all you have to prove. So a sexual service is sex, prostitution, pornography, um, illicit performances, anything sexually related in exchange for something of value. So something of value, your most common scenario is sex in exchange for cash, but it could be drugs, room, a room, a rent, rent, a ride, um, anything, a happy meal, it could be anything. Anything you can place a value on if you exchange it for some sort of sexual service. If the victim is under 18, that is all you have to prove. So that you don't have to move, you don't have to be in, under someone's control or authority, that's all you have to prove. If you're over 18, you have to prove force, fraud, and coercion. So you have the sexual act in exchange for something of value with some element of force, fraud, or coercion. So a lot of times you'll see um, someone who consents to one thing, like they consent to driving out to Las Vegas for a modeling job, and when they get there, they're picked up and sold into some sort of trafficking. Um, the consent obviously is revoked at that point. They don't, they're not consenting to that, so that's the fraud. Um, there could be some sort of physical force, chains and bondage. You don't see that a lot. You mostly see emotional, um, emotional coercion, blackmail, um, Y'all mentioned grooming earlier. They gro the men groom these women to think that they need them. They can't live without them. They're not worth anything, or they may be addicted to drugs. And so this is the only way they're keeping on getting their fix. And they usually do addicted to drugs very quickly. So if the if the victim is an adult, there's some level of force, fraud, or coercion. Um, I'm I'm tasked with telling y'all what's going on in Mississippi, so I'm going to try to focus on that. Um, so last year, we were able to pass a law that says women under 18 can no longer be charged with prostitution. And we got some pushback on that. People said they can choose that. They, they, some of them want to be prostitutes. And sometimes they do tell you that they want that. And my question is, why? What was their choice? If they chose to be a prostitute, what was their choice? And often you'll see that they are running from or move, leaving something worse. So there's almost always been some level of abuse, sexual abuse in the home. I mean, in the 90 percentage, you see, 90 percentile, you see trafficking victims who had some sort of abuse in their background. And they think, well, it was happening to me at home, so I can choose to do this on the street and get paid for it. Well, that's not really a good choice, you know? And so we think if you're under 18, you're not gonna be put in a detention center. Even if you wanna do this, well then when you're 19, you can go back and try again, but we're gonna try to get you some services if you're under 18 and see what's wrong, what, is, what are you actually running from or trying to escape from. Um, and that's federal law also, not all states have that law. Mississippi had some version of it, but we were still requiring minors some level of proof, and we don't want that. We don't want them to have to prove anything. Um, you know, we have statutory rape laws, and we were saying, you can't consent to having sex, but we're putting you in jail for being a prostitute, which is a little bit contradictory. So, got that straightened out last year. Um, <coughs> House Speaker Philip Gunn led the charge on that, and he's, he's great, and he called us back after the legislative session last year and said, what next? And we never see that from politicians. They usually say, that's a great bill, check the box, go home and tell my constituents how great I did. And I work with the legislature, we have a lot of great people down there, they're just not always <laughs> followed through, they don't realize there's need. And Philip Gunn said, what's next? And so we've been meeting all summer to talk about what is next, what do we need legally um, to get Mississippi on the right track. And we have really good laws. Part of what we don't have is really good enforcement, and that's really nobody's fault, it's just a lack of education, which is why these kind of situations, these kind of forums are so important. We need our law enforcement and prosecutors and judges aware of what evidence is needed when they <coughs> see one of these cases, how to prosecute them, and then how to punish the criminals. So, working on all of that. Um, we have currently one home for adults in Mississippi, and they, they can only house six women. It's a domestic violence shelter in Jackson, and they opened this home two years ago, and they're doing great stuff. They're always full um, with a waiting list. Looking really forward to having this home here that you guys are talking about. That'll be a great addition. We have nothing for children in this day. We have literally nothing. Um, I am pushing, and part of what our group's mission is, is to, is to get housing for kids. So I'm, I'm really pushed in our current group homes and foster groups because they're the ones who already know how to take care of children well. 
So I really want them to renovate some of their houses. And um, they love when I, when I show up and tell them all the things they need to do. But um, we, we really want them to be the ones to take the charge on that. Our group is kind of to serve as an umbrella organization and bring everybody together. We don't want to start a group home. We don't think that's what we're qualified to do. But we do want to help facilitate other people doing that. So we're working on policy and procedure. We've talked to groups in other states and gotten a lot of good ideas. So we want to help facilitate that as well as we can. Um, we do have five task forces around the state. Jackson, the Coast, Batesville, Tupelo, and Hattiesburg. And they're all working really well. What they do is it's a conglomeration of law enforcement and service providers. So it's FBI, NBI, local guys, um, and they work together on some of these cases. Sometimes they'll do reverse stings or ops and um, arrest people. Sometimes they're just sharing information. I sit in the meetings for the one in Jackson and I love to hear them talk and just say, what's going on, what cases they have? And then somebody will pipe up and say, <coughs> hey, because you know, it's really, it's confidential in the room, and they'll say, hey, the girl in that case, was that so-and-so? And they're like, yeah, like, we saw her a couple weeks ago, wherever. And it's great to see them be able to piece things together. Um, or you'll have a guy saying, we got this one guy, we got this phone, we can't get into it. I don't know what we're going to do. We can't get the evidence. And the FBI guy always raises his hand and says, hey, get me that phone. I'll, I'll get it for you. I'll get it open for you. <laughs> you know, so it's really good to see them working together. Um, with those task forces are rapid responders across the state, and Amanda Dollar is here. She is your rapid responder in Tupelo, um, and that's who you call when you suspect or one of the or who law enforcement will call when they suspect one of these cases. And, and Amanda and the other women across the state will come and be the victim service advocate in that situation. So always call on them. Um, U.S. Attorney Mike Hurst just started a human trafficking council which is just bringing more awareness, bringing more people to the table, so we're glad to see that. We have, last year's legislation put a human trafficking coordinator at MBI, which is the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation. Up until now, we've had no way of knowing how many cases we have, and this is really a hard crime to quantify. I mean, no one raises their hand and says, hey, put me down as, as, one, as a victim, or, you know, what, that, we just don't, we can't quantify it. There's really no way to do that. Um, but now we are going to start tracking these cases and hopefully people with CPS and law enforcement will report to NBI and we'll start to get numbers, names, and we'll be able to make cases by seeing these cases, these people that are repeatedly reported and things like that. Um, there's also supposed to be a coordinator at CPS and they haven't filled that position yet, but we hope that that person will create specialized multidisciplinary teams so that when a child victim is found, they go into a special track. They don't just get put in the mass of CPS with everyone else. They go into a special track, they're treated differently, they get services immediately, and then we follow them through the system. Because right now what's happening, you'll see a child who runs away from home, they get involved with drugs or some sort of crime, um, they, get, they get involved with trafficking, and what they'll get arrested. Well, someone misses, um, someone misses the trafficking part of it, and they arrest them for drugs or whatever it is, that child goes to a detention center, they'll stay a few days there. When they get out, they'll go into foster care or to a group home and they'll run away from there because no one ever addressed their root cause of abuse or whatever it was they ran away from. So then they're back on the street, they go back to their pimp and their trafficker and it's just a big cycle because they're not getting specialized services. So what we really hope to see is all these groups who provide services, let's come together and get, make sure these people get the treatment that they need so they're not just cycling in and out of the system. Um, we do have something coming up that I would love for y'all to participate in. We're doing a statewide awareness day, so it's October 28th, and this video that I hope y'all can see, we have it cut down to three minutes, so we would love for like churches to show it, um, youth groups, that kind of thing, and then on Monday the 28th, write no more on your hand and like post something on social media that way. We just want to garner attention for this, we, and we think this is the perfect time to do it because people are talking about it. It's not that it's trendy, but it's just becoming a thing, and we're all discussing it, so let's capitalize on that. And I mean, I think every state is, is doing something, but no one really seems to be doing it really well. And I would love to see Mississippi be a leader in something for once. You know, we have a lot of great people doing good work, so I want us to all come together. And like I said, just be thinking about what it is that you can do in your capacity. Like, you know, we need, if you work in a dentist office, ask your dentist if they would see one trafficking victim a year for free. 
because they often come in with a lot of health issues, or a doctor's office, would they just check somebody out and do a medical exam for free? These people don't have documentation. They certainly don't have insurance. They usually don't have their driver's license. Someone's holding all their, you know, documents. So we need them to be seen quickly in those kind of situations. Tattoo removal. Y'all mentioned the brands earlier. Plastic surgeons who remove brands. You know, in, any of that. Like, if you work in an office in an admin position, you know, in a medical office, could you ask them if they would help these victims just once or twice a year? Because if everyone does it, then you don't have you don't have somebody coming every single day. We can all share the burden, you know. Um, what do y'all need to know? What questions do y'all have? <laughs> yeah. I had the opportunity to share with you a proposed uh, or, uh, resolution for the Mississippi legislature, and thank you to Ann uh, for uh, the uh, the article that she co-authored uh, on the cover of uh, American Family Journal. October on the issue of sex trafficking and what can be done about it. And thank you for your involvement in the legislation. Pornography is a big 800 pound gorilla in the room. People don't like to talk about it. Pastors don't like to address it from the pulpit. Sunday school teachers stay away from it. it it's too touchy a subject, but it needs to be addressed. Pornography fuels and is the, the demand that creates the supply of women and children who are trafficked. There's going to be a speaker on yeah. And um, so what can we do about the 800-pound gorilla in the room? Yeah, I'm glad so you we, said that. Some people... The has the opportunity to join 15 other states that have passed resolutions that declare that pornography is a public health crisis. Some people argue the pornography issue, that it's not a driving factor, and I think it, I firmly believe that it is. Um, someone asked me the other day when I was speaking if, if trafficking, if, this, if it's new, is it growing? Prostitution and slavery have been around since the beginning of time. I mean, y'all y'all are Bible church people in here, y'all know that. Those are the oldest crimes, some of the oldest things in the Bible. So no, it's not new. Um, and I don't even know if it's growing as much as it just that we're aware of it now, but pornography is fueling the fire. So um, with technology, 90% of human trafficking starts online somehow. So. In my opinion, people are looking. People are looking at pornography, and you know, just like just like when you look for shoes on on Google or Amazon or whatever, then you start getting ads for more shoes, right? Like, so your computer's tracking you, and they know what you're looking for. So the same with pornography. So you're looking at something, well, then it starts advertising to you other things, and certain, and suddenly what you're looking at is not enough, and so you're looking at something kinkier or younger or with some sort of fetish and I'm sorry if these words are uncomfortable they're not uncomfortable for me so um, you're probably gonna hear a lot about sex today <laughs> um, it's hard to, they start targeting you with those kind of things so then it's then then the pictures are no longer enough and people are going to act on those things and I'll tell you um, they say the average age of people entering human trafficking is age 14 to 16. We don't really know that. We think that's true, but if you, but if you ask a bunch of 16-year-olds, the average age might be 12 because they were younger. If you ask 28-year-olds, the average age might be 20. We don't really know that. Um, but I will tell you that when our law enforcement does stings, they always advertise a 14-year-old girl. So there's no girl involved, but they'll post an ad that says, this 14-year-old girl is selling herself. Are you interested? And the people come out of the woodworks and they show up in their suits, in their police uniforms, in their pest control trucks. There is no demographic, no race, no age is immune. Um, but 14 years old is an age that they are looking for. So that's pretty scary. Um, I do, and I think it's not just pornography, but it's the technology. So used to, you would have to find a time in your day to drive to some seedy part of town, roll your window down, Proposition a girl, what if it's an undercover sting? There's a lot of risk involved. There's not a lot of risk involved right now because all you do is you set it up on your phone, you go meet the person. If you drive up and it looks suspicious, you bail, but you, you set it all up online and it's, it's anonymous and, you, and it's easy to do. You know, um, Someone mentioned earlier Snapchat and social media. These predators are targeting our kids through social media. So what they do is they pretend to be younger than they really are. They send them direct messages. They try to build a relationship. Um, the, the grooming process takes place over months. Um, and they'll gradually introduce explicit material. And they're talking to you know young kids, 12, 
10, 12, 14 year old kids and they're pretending to be 16 or 18, which that kid thinks is cool, but really they're an adult. They'll introduce explicit material and then they'll ask for naked pictures. And two thirds of our kids admit that they've been asked to send naked pictures online. And I would venture to say it's almost 100% because I would have never admitted that if someone asked me that. When I was a teenager, I would have never said yes. So I would assume it's more than two thirds. And then half of those admit to sending the pictures. Um, and then what the person does is they blackmail them and say, if you don't come, if you don't meet up with me, I'm going to put this online, I'm going to tell your parents. <clears throat> but they intervened with someone recently in Pearl, and the, the girl's mom discovered what was going on on the phone, called the police, and so police showed up to meet the guy who had propositioned her online, and the guy had a black bag, duct tape, and weapons in his car. He was coming to kidnap that child. So... Um, and this was, a, this was not a child who was poor, uneducated, in a bad part of town. It was just a kid who had social media. Okay, so it's anybody's a target. Our people who are generally targeted are, are vulner, that are vulnerable, poor, lack of education, lack of family structure, um, <coughs> mom works a lot, single mom who works multiple jobs, those kind of things, but now it's any kid. Any kid with a phone is, can be a target. Um, first off, this is awesome. Um, but my question, if we say if you see something that's questionable, do we immediately call 911? Like, what should we do? Because I, don't, I sure don't want to be a bystander. Like, I want to do something if I see something that's questionable. <coughs> So she said, if you see something, what do you do? Great question. We have some cards out on our table. Y'all get that. It has the National Human Trafficking Hotline number on it. It's kind of easy to remember if you want to put it in your phone. 888-3737-888. Um, that is the Polaris hotline, and what they do is they have people in every state who they can call on. So your local 911 may not know what to do at all. So we really recommend, now if so, if you see someone being harmed in the moment, you need to call 911. So if you have a situation that you suspect is human trafficking, you wanna get all the information you can. You got that phone, take pictures. You know what I mean, pretend you're taking a selfie and get the people in the background. Whatever you need to do to get any information, license plates, um, hair color, any information, and report to that national hotline, and they'll filter it down to who on the ground in Mississippi can address that. Um, we never recommend that you take matters into your own hands. Someone messaged me recently and said, I saw this situation, and she said, and I'm so mad at myself, I didn't have the courage to just put her in the car with me. And I thought, well, thank God you didn't put her in the car with you, you know? Um, they, their pimps track their phones. So, you put her in your car, and now you're, you and your family are going to be a target. So don't put them in your car. Don't reach. I mean, you can, if, if you're in a situation where you can have a conversation and offer them help, maybe, but you really want to get people, professionals involved. Um, different things to watch for, like if you're in a gas station, someone who um, steals personal hygiene items in Walmart or CVS or a gas station because they're not being provided those. Um, stealing condoms and feminine hygiene items are a common, it's a common sign because their pimp's not providing those for them. People who don't make eye contact, they don't have any, um, they don't speak for themselves, they don't have any documentation. So if you're in a gas station and someone's like buying cigarettes or something and they don't have their own driver's license and their own money, someone's providing that for them, that might be a sign. Or if they're in the restroom and someone's standing, standing guard outside the restroom, they don't have freedom of movement. As far as young people and people in your community that you might see, kids who were normally shy or withdrawn or didn't have a lot of money and they're showing up with expensive bags, their nails done, new makeup, that might be somebody who's grooming them and providing them, buying things for them, paying to have their nails and makeup done in that grooming process. Um, for kids who are targeted on social media that might be in your own home, you're looking for them to be more withdrawn, um, spending more time in their room, more emotional and upset because they've got this burden on them now that they're worried about they can't share it with someone. Yeah, that call that hotline. Can you give that number again? Yeah, it's 888-3737-888. And you say it kind of funny to remember it, but. <laughs> and it's, it's on that card that we have out at our table too. You can text it. You don't text that number, but there's like a six-digit number. So if you go, um, just Google a National Human Trafficking Hotline, they'll have the number that you can text. I can't remember that off the top of my head. But yeah, you can text that for sure. Oh, okay, good, good. Question? What is the law in Mississippi concerning the 
So we actually said, what's the law? So we actually have really good law for human trafficking. The problem is it's really hard to prosecute the cases. So say in the case where I talked about where the guy showed up about to kidnap the girl, he didn't actually exchange money and he didn't actually kidnap. So you're only going to be able to charge him with an attempted something. So that's just your regular attempted kidnapping laws. For human trafficking, um, for minors, it's like 30 years to life if they actually go through with it. And the people who can be charged with that are anybody that has anything to do with it. So it's not just a pimp, but if you purchase sex from a, of a minor and it's considered trafficking, you could also get 30 years to life. It could also be anyone who <coughs> aids in that. So they have what they call bottom girls, who is a girl who's been in the life for a long time, and she is in charge of the younger girls. She could be charged as a pimp. If you run a truck stop and you know it happens on your property and you don't do anything about it or you're paid off, you can be charged as a pimp. So all of those people can get 30 years to life if a child is involved. The problem is the cases are just really hard to prosecute. Our law enforcement doesn't know how to get the correct evidence right now and they always want the victim to testify. But the thing is, you don't have a victim testify in a murder case and people go to jail for murder every day. So. We need to get our prosecutors and our judges ready to take these cases without a victim because it's extremely traumatic for them, particularly a child, to have to testify. And they're scared <coughs> of their lives, so they don't want to do that. So we haven't seen a whole lot of cases go through actually under trafficking. What they usually do is charge them for drug, possession, weapons, anything they can get them on just to get them off the street. And we support that too. We'd love to see them go to jail for life, but if they get them off the street for any, under any other means, then that's what they have to do sometimes. You want to stop and watch this? Okay. <coughs> countries or in poverty or police in our state arrested dozens of sex trafficking The undercover operation takes down cases of prostitution in our area. Human trafficking is happening here in Mississippi. It's like an underworld epidemic. It's, it's something that is creeping into all of our communities. It's a growing problem, a problem that a lot of people really didn't know was, was here until we started investigating. The largest misconception about human trafficking is that it's bondage and interstate travel only. Sex trafficking is profiting from selling the services of sexual favors for anything of value. You have this image of trailer life. Facebook page, Mississippians Against Human Trafficking, is pinned at the top. So, yeah. Yeah, so go to that, and then on Instagram, we're no more trafficking MS, but you can find the link to all that on there. So, yeah. So, yeah, contact me, um, and you can just e email us through our website and tell us that you want to be involved, and we're going to post that closer to time. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, uh, our next speaker is Sheriff Jim Johnson, uh, who has been in continuous law enforcement in our area for 30 years, and he has served as our sheriff since 2004. Uh, he's on the inside, and he sees the horrors uh, that women and children experience uh, in our area. So um, I think what we, what we tend to do is we tend to kind of remove things from ourselves that we don't want to think about, and we tend to think, oh, that's in another country, and then we find out it's here, and we think, oh, well, it's in our country, but it's in another part of our country, and then we find out, oh, it's in our state, but it's in another part of our state. And so um, Sheriff Jim Johnson is going to come and share with us um, that it is, it is here. So we appreciate you, Sheriff Johnson, for sharing with us. Thank you. 
you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, how many of y'all have experienced in sh some shape, form, or fashion through sitting on a grand jury in, in Lee County or Pontotoc, since we're in Pontotoc, or you are kin to some law enforcement officer or somebody that is connected with Department of Human Services or Family and Children Services that has told y'all human trafficking is right here in your backyard. So I don't have to sell you and tell you that it's here. We just had a grand jury convened the last two weeks, and there were four cases taken before the grand jury in Lee County of human trafficking here. Four years ago, I would have told you we couldn't even spell it here. It just it wasn't here. Uh, Tupelo and Pontotoc is a unique area because we travel between Memphis and Atlanta, Georgia. And Super Bowl weekend, we made a traffic stop on Veterans Boulevard and I-22 that had two male subjects in it in a stolen Yukon. And in that Yukon, we rescued two 14-year-old girls. That was human trafficked, taken over to Atlanta, Georgia, because guess where the Super Bowl was? It was in the new Mercedes-Benz Dome, and that was a avenue for them to support that particular thing. And that's what they do. They congregate around large crowds, festivals and things, and you see more and more and more of that, especially on a local level, because a lot of the people that are in human trafficking are not uneducated, and I'm talking about the ones that produce it, the ones that uh, promote it, the ones that are involved in it, the ones that are getting the kids to get involved. They are not uneducated people, folks. They are very educated and know, they know how to manipulate the system. A lot of times they are in the system. They are part of the system. Probably one of the most eye-opening experiences I had was I had an opportunity to be a part of sitting down and talking to some individuals uh, about the particular program that is starting here in Lee County for the home. A matter of fact, that home is going to be in my former church. And when I sat down, they said, we'd like for you to come and sit down with some individuals that uh, are going to be helping there and things of that nature. So I went in and I sat down at this meeting and it was kind of strange because I sat down at this table and there were two ladies that kind of sat way away from me over there. And I thought, well, that, that's kind of strange. We're going to have to holler if we talk across the room back and forth. And you know what it was? Those two individuals were victims of sex trafficking. And now they were grown. The reason I posed a threat is one of them was married to a police officer that sex trafficked her. And so just my presence in the room was a threat, and I had to build that report up to begin with before we ever even got down to the, to the headache. Another thing I'll tell you is this. The, the individual here that said child pornography or pornography is the root of this, I will echo that 100%. And I'll tell you why. How many of y'all have ever seen Dateline? How many of y'all, and you go admit your age, how many of you several, several, several years ago was infatuated with Dateline when this particular module came out and it was called to, to catch a predator? And what it was, was Dateline started on, I'll never forget it, it was on a Wednesday night and they aired a one hour segment and they had connected with, lo with local law enforcement in Florida, in California, in some of these big cities and what they did was they took this home, they took this undercover officer and he posed as a 14 or 15 year old child. They put this child online to see how many sexual predators would contact this child for sexual purposes. <clears throat> and I just got infatuated with them catching these people. Well, I really got infatuated when they were catching them for an hour on end, they would catch four or five, and before you knew it, they had to extend this thing to a two-hour program. And before you knew it, they had it on Wednesday night and on Sunday night. <coughs> then before you knew it, they had it on Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I got to watching them, and you'd see them catch them on Wednesday, and about three weeks later, they'd catch the same person three or four weeks later. And I realized then, my goodness, this is an epidemic. So. We, here in Lee County, was the first Sheriff's Department to pull that same steam. Now this right here is in your backyard. Th this is here. This, I'm not talking about in Jackson. I'm talking about right here in your own yard. So we pulled an undercover steam where we put two 
fake girls, 13 and 14 years old. We downloaded a picture from a church magazine, from a church directory. So I told you that to tell you there was nothing provocative. It was an appropriate picture of two young girls, and we made up two names. We said they went to school here, one at Saltilla, one at Tupelo. And we put them online just to see how many people would co contact them. In less than an hour, I had over 70 men talking to these kids for all kinds of reasons. Because I'm telling you, social media is the network of today. You, we don't do this anymore. We do this. And that's the way society is. They were contact, there were coaches contacting them about, hey, I see you play softball, where are you going to school? Which was legitimate. But we also had a number of those 70-something that you could tell right off the bat. I show a PowerPoint program to high schools and churches and youth groups. And I show the actual chat log of these sexual predators talking to these girls. And the most amazing thing is I purposely leave the time stamp on there. Because you know what time they're talking to us? 7 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock at night. It's not 3 o'clock in the morning and creepy old people doing this. No, because you know what's going on at 6 and 7 and 8 o'clock at night? Kids doing homework on the computer. And they're connecting with them. And they contacted them. Over this one-year period, we made it 47 arrests. And you must tell you where they met us to have sex with these girls? They met us at the Elvis Presley birthplace. They met us at Food Giant in South Tula. They met us at Cracker Barrel in Tupelo. And they met us at Home Depot. Now the reason I did that was, if you remember back, and you were watching Dateline, they rented this house or apartment, and they were hidden behind four walls. And the guy would contact them, they would introduce themselves, they would ask the child to come over, they would ask could they come over and visit with the child, and you would see the outside cameras and the guy driving by, and he'd drive by real sneaky-like. And he'd always do it at night, and he'd pull up in the driveway, and he'd look around, and all of a sudden he would run in the carport, and then he was in this house. So there was never really visibility of what was going on. So we wanted to change it just to see how determined these people would be to come in broad daylight and meet these kids. So every single place these people came to Lee County, Mississippi to meet this child was in broad daylight, and there was no four walls. It was parking lots where you shop each and every day and we made these arrests. And that's how, that is the reality of what is going on here. In sex trafficking today, my wife is the court administrator for Youth Court here in Tupelo for Judge Bevel. The number of runaway kids in the last year have doubled here. And a lot of it is because they're in, connected with social media. They're connected with the internet in some shape, form, or fashion. They think there's a better life promised them for some other than where they're at right now. And so they run away from home, not having any idea what the end result's going to be. And when they run away with this great promise of hope, and a lot of times, a lot of times, it will be another child involved that they connect with that is their age. Let's say it's a 15-year-old girl that runs away from home. She's met this 15 or 16 year old legitimate. It's not a 30 or 40 year old posing, it's a 15 or 16 year old boy that is legitimate, that's cute, that looks good, that promises her, builds up this relationship online, and they agree, hey, Sunday night, right after church, let's meet at Walmart, I've got my grandmother's car, we'll take off. And so they meet, not thinking anything about it. But the secret is, this boy may not be involved in somebody having sex with him, but he is making money because he is hired by the sex trafficker to get the girl to have a relationship with him. You see how it's connected? It all connects. And another thing that I tell people is this, people that are involved in sex trafficking and, and getting these kids involved, don't walk around with a t-shirt on or a light bulb on their head and you can say, oh, there's one young lady, stay away from him, or there's one over there, stay away from him. No, they work, eat, live, breathe, go to church. Every single day you are around them. I'm telling you, they're here. 
They're involved. When we did this undercover operation, I kept up with the occupations of these people, these 40-something people that we arrested. They were electricians. They were law enforcement. We had a deputy sheriff drive from Henderson County, Tennessee down here. We had a catastrophic recovery specialist when Hurricane Katrina was on the coast from Michigan that went down there to look and survey land, very educated, that would turn over all the figures to MEMA to figure out how much money that the state of Mississippi was going to get from the federal government. He was using the same computer and the GPS to drive up here and meet one of a 14-year-old girl at Cracker Barrel for sexual purposes. We even during that operation found out that they would bring things with them. They brought clothes for the girl to wear. They brought video cameras and cameras to film what was going on. Our, our two children lived with a single mother, supposedly, and the mother worked, so the child was at home at night. These people would drive up here thinking that this mother was going to be gone for two or three nights, and this guy was going to stay in your house with your child for two nights and take advantage of your child. So I'm telling you that they have got a sick mind that they will get and do whatever they can to get their victim. Do you know in the state of Mississippi, the only felony charge that law enforcement, medical people, psychological people, and ministerial people have all agreed and looked at and said, you better mark this person for the rest of your life because they are likely not going to change of this epidemic. When you are convicted of a sexual crime in the state of Mississippi, you register as a sex offender. And you're registered for the rest of your life. You know why? Because when we have a child missing, you know the first place we look? At that list. You can go in a school and shoot everybody in there. And you know what? You'll never be on the list. You can take out everybody here in this room and you can drink and drive every single day. And you know what? You're not gonna be on a marked list that we look at. It's only for people that are involved in sexual crimes because it is a sickness that is beyond describable. And it is a life that is unbearable. Now you ask how do kids get involved in it? I'm gonna tell you how. I've got a daughter, she's 29 and she teaches school at Nettleton right now. But when Kelly was about 15, 14 or 15 years old, she had the first love of her life. And believe it or not, he was from Honotok. That was a mistake to begin with. But he was from Honotok. I'll never forget. I was at a church on Sunday night speaking for some uh, event, and Kelly, my daughter, was there, and she was sitting on the back row. And I noticed Kelly and this young man, his name was Grant. Y'all may know him. I'll tell you who it is. It was Grant Warner from Lee, from Pontotoc. His, his granddad was a sheriff here. Great people, great family. And if I was going to pick anybody for Kelly today, it would have been Grant, because Grant was a good kid. Hey, they met in church. That's what you want. So they're sitting back there. She's not listening. One thing her daddy says, they're swapping notes. They're doing everything in the world. After it's over with, there's a hamburger fellowship. We go to the fellowship hall. Guess who Kelly sits with? Not daddy. Sits with Grant. So they kind of have a relationship going on and off for a little while. Well, about eight or nine months later, that thing goes south. And then Kelly comes to daddy and says, Grant has broke up. And I said, oh, no. I've never seen my daughter is hurt. I'm going, yes. But she says, and Daddy, he did it by sending me a text message. Y'all, Grant's been missing ever since. <laughs> but the reason I told you that is this. My daughter was hurt. And it wasn't because she come from a bad family. It wasn't because her dad and mom mistreated her or anything else. She was a little girl that was hurt over her emotions and life not going like it's supposed to. There is so much pressure on kids today. It is unbelievable. And whether you wake up in, a, in a, the Bible belt of the state of Mississippi, we live in an evil, sick, morally corrupt world. And sin is abound. It's here every single day. And that's why we're where we're at. But she was so hurt, and all it would have taken was the right person to say the right thing at the right time, and she could have very easily been a victim. Very easily. So 
They're all amongst you. They're living in the home with you, victims and everything else. And I can tell you it is prevalent and it is real here. Uh, we're lucky that we are one of the host agencies, as she said, that does the training. Uh, they actually meet at our office once a month, and it's very encouraging to see where we're going. I applaud uh, Steve and Dave and them for, uh, and the volunteers that will be helping and getting this thing going here in Lee County. We are so blessed. Um, when I took office in 04, prior to that I was an investigator, and I worked violence against women and children. In some of the t I, and I was glad to get out of it because after about five years it began to wear on me and I thought I was going to go crazy by just the abuse and, and things that went on. And what I found out was here I am sitting here in this room and this poor child or this lady that has been abused by a male subject in a very long relationship and some of it was very violent. They would come into my office and you know the last person they wanted to talk to was another strange man. I mean that just was not going well. So we hired a grandmother, Miss Donna Franks, that works for me now, sweet lady, and she works all the violence against women and children, kind of heads up our task force. But we also have got a great resource here with the, with the Family and Children's Resource Center where we can do the 803 hearings now, where we can get away from what she was talking about, the child don't have to testify in court. We can put them with a counselor, we can video that, and the video can be played in court now where the child does not have to face their accuser, which has helped a lot. So there are a lot of good things that are going on, but it takes everybody. The sheriff's office and law enforcement can't do it by themselves. But I'm going to tell you the last couple of things I want to tell you is this. What y'all are looking at to be volunteers and, and the help in this <coughs> is going to be so crucial. Because I'm going to tell you something. When we stopped this, when we stopped this Yukon and we got those two little girls out, we didn't have time to go through no hoopla and no rigmarole and no waiting period and no background checks. Now, we needed help and we needed it right then. And we did not need to haul them around in the, in the patrol car or anything else. And me and my wife, does, does anybody here work for uh, Department of Human Services or Family and Children Services? Okay, she's gonna echo what I'm saying here. Here we go. Because the reason I said that is this. There is a very rigorous and strenuous process to go through to become a foster parent. I mean, it's, it's very hard. And our church at First Baptist Church Tupelo were big on foster parenting. So me and my wife decided that we wanted to try to help out with foster parenting. And our role was going to be, if you are a foster parent and, you're, and you as a foster parent want to go on a vacation or you want to break and you want to let those kids that are in your house go somewhere, they can only go to another foster licensed person. You can't send them to grandma. You can send your own kids but not foster kids. So you needed foster parents for foster parents. And I thought, okay, we'll narrow this thing down, you know, as, as myself, is we want this age, uh, you know, we'll take male or female, and we would be the foster parent for the foster parent. So we go through the 11th month training thing. I mean, they inspect our home, I go to the Saturday classes, we take all the tests, they know everything financially about me, they know about my past life, and I still past. Can you believe that? And, and everything, but we went through this rigorous thing for about 10 or 11 months. So the last day comes up, we're getting ready to get our license, the lady, sweet lady comes and she inspects our house one more time. She looks at our house. We said, when will we be uh, uh, licensed people? She said, y'all should get it in about two weeks. So we were so excited. I've got a small, I got an eight year old little boy too. Yes, I got a 29 year old and an eight year old. Jim needs prayer, okay? <laughs> but he's so excited because he don't have anybody at home to play with and he's getting this baby brother or sister for two days maybe. So we're excited about it. My wife calls me, she says, Y'all didn't pass. I said, what? They said, we can't be foster parents. I said, why in the world can we not be foster parents? And you know why we can't be foster parents? Because my house is upstairs, and I don't have a window upstairs. I can't be a foster parent. It's just a rule. Nothing wrong with it. It's a safe rule. Something happens. Kids got to get out. There's no window upstairs. So then I got to thinking, oh gosh, they're going to come take my eight-year-old away because he sleeps upstairs. <laughs> but the reason, the reason I told you that, it's not anything wrong with it, but we need people that can help us right now, today. We, we can't wait to go through this process, so thank y'all so much for what y'all are doing. And we're putting a wind in our house because we're going to beat that system. I tell you, we're going to do that.
The last thing I'd tell you is this on a personal note. My dad was a Sunday school teacher at First Baptist Church, Verona, where Anchor Church is right now, for 44 years. He taught upstairs in the education room. I walk in that room right now. And my dad, every single Sunday, and Miss Thelma is here. Well, well there she is. She's here. She'll tell you. My dad was, to me, one of the most godliest men I ever knew. And, and I just hope that I am a third of what he is. But my dad prayed every Sunday at home before he ever went to that Sunday school class. And it's my motto in my office today that I hope people that leave my class today are a better person than they were when they come in. That I hope God can use me and my little, and he just, he continued to pray that for 40 something years. Well, my dad passed away in 06 of cancer. He's been gone over 10 years. Do you know that one of the rooms that is being built at the Anchor Church that's going to house women is my dad's Sunday school class? <laughs> so, as moral and corrupt as the world may be, we serve an awesome God Amen. that knows more than we will ever know. And because of that, he is going to reward your efforts. And thank y'all from the bottom of my heart for y'all doing what you do.